This is a production of Cornell University. Well, it's actually a real pleasure for me to, uh, to come back to Cornell and just to be on the campus and, to, of course, to have the chance to give um, this lecture. Uh, I'm not sure if it says kind of good things about Cornell or bad things about me, but kind of reflecting um, on some of the, uh, the kind of questions Victor asked me to prepare for for a talk I had with some doctoral students, you know, it occurred to me that what I'm doing now is really not that different from what I was doing uh, really you know, 20 years ago at Cornell. So certainly I've been kind of very strongly imprint, imprinted. Um, let me say a little bit about the paper I'll talk about today. First of all, the title is the gentleman slavers, not the gentleman slave, uh, as was on this advertisement, which I'm sure is my fault. I'm sure it's my fault, but it seems to um, evoke uh, something very different than what I'm going to talk about. So if you came to hear about the gentleman slave, this may not be the talk for you. Uh, we are, as Victor said, going to study the slave trade as it was um, practiced in um, Liverpool which is called, I think, you know, appropriately, the slave trading capital of the world. Uh, and we're going to look at, um, ultimately, we're going to consider a lot of forces as they inform one question, which is who among investors in overseas shipping went into the slave trade. Right? So it would p be possible to invest in overseas shipping but not invest in slave voyages. Or an investor could go into the slave trade. Um, and we're going to look at uh, who goes in. Uh, and our the kind of high level take on this question is that we're viewing this as really an instance of anti normative or countercultural economic activity. Right? So you could also think about this as when do people engage in economic activity which is against cultural norms. Um, you could think about it as the diffusion of deviance. Uh, you're going to see here that really. We're going to look at the interaction between a network and cultural influences informed by a social movement. So you could think about um, you could think about uh, this is an opportunity for looking at uh, you know how those two forces on behavior uh, influence each other. Uh, I'll say a little bit very briefly about how I came to study. Um, uh, Liverpool slave traders, it's a, the interaction of two forces. One is that I had done some research on the shipbuilding, particularly in the UK. I'd studied shipbuilding in Glasgow, Scotland. And Liverpool was a rival shipbuilding center to Glasgow. So I was always a little bit interested in Liverpool. And I would tell my colleagues and friends that I was interested in Liverpool as a research site. Uh, and my co-author, Brian Silverman, is a very big Beatles fan. Uh, so he was very motivated to study Liverpool and to go to Liverpool because uh, he wanted to pay homage to uh, his heroes, wh which he did on various data collection trips. So I think those were the um, kind of two um, forces that come together to produce uh, this paper. I'd like to begin by giving you a little background on the industry, on the on the trade. Um, you know, I've actually found that perhaps somewhat surprising, but. Uh, um, how this industry and this trade was practiced uh, is often kind of uh, lost to us. And, uh, and uh, you know, some elements of it you know, may, may be surprising given uh, your expectations. So I'll tell you a little bit, first of all, about the industry. First of all, the slave trade is what's called a triangle trade, uh, which ref refers to the fact that these voyages um, had uh, uh, you know, three important points. They would leave from. Western Europe, uh, in our case Liverpool. They would go to the west coast of Africa. Right? And they would take from, uh, from Europe, they would take tradables, uh, which would be um, about 50% of the time textiles, iron, uh, guns, alcohol. Uh, they would take that to the west coast of Africa. They would trade on the west coast of Africa for slaves. They would take the slaves to the Americas, where they would sell them. And if they had time, 
they would uh, load up with staples, sugar, tobacco, and cotton, and bring them back to Europe. So that last leg was really kind of dependent on, um, uh, on the calendar, because this whole cycle took, takes about a year. And uh, it was more economically viable to come home empty on the last leg than to wait to fill up your, uh, your ship if it was going to mean you were going to miss the cycle. The kind of constraint on the cycle, the reason that uh, you've got this kind of, um, you can't launch the voyages at any time, is that on the West African coast, you have to load food for the slaves, mostly yams. And there's only certain times of the year that, that it was possible to do that. Uh, now, at the same time, there was a dyadic direct trade. Right? We could go from Europe to the Americas, uh, bringing perhaps manufactured goods one way and staples going back the other way. Right? So that's how we've got this kind of possibility of a, um, a you know, really this choice that our economic actors are making between what we're going to view, and I'm going to explain to you the argument for this is a counter-normative economic activity to engage in the slave trade, or something which is completely legitimate and um, uh, normative, which is the direct uh, trade. Now, a little bit about the Liverpool slave traders. Where did they go in West Africa? Uh, they went mostly to uh, what's called the Bight of Biafra, which is you know, right here uh, in what's now Nigeria. Uh, two ports in particular. Um, one called uh, Calabar and one called Bonny. Uh, and the kind of difference between those par ports is um, uh, indicative. Uh, tells you a little bit about what it took to do this trade well. Uh, at Bonny, there was a fort. Right? It, was a, it was not staffed by Europeans. It was a, a fort staffed by Africans. Um, but the fort would uh, you know, collect slaves. And you could load them onto the ships you know, fairly quickly. And at Calabar, uh, there was no fort. It was a very diffuse trade. Uh, and the ship captains would trade with um, uh, African traders one, two handful of slaves at a time. And it might take them months to uh, fill up their cargo with uh, uh, slaves. So the Liverpool traders actually were distinguished, I'll tell you a little bit about why, in this latter form of the trade. So. Uh, in the, uh, this kind of relational dyadic exchange, which actually takes more skills on the part of the captain. They've got to do more negotiations and so on. Uh, one of the things they did well relative to their rivals is they could go to different places where there weren't forts because they had really come down to the human capital to carry out, uh, to carry out that uh, more complex trade. Uh, but you can see, in fact, that they you know, did visit a range of places in West Africa. Where did they go in the Americas? The Liverpool slave traders uh, went uh, mostly to Barbados and Jamaica. Not much to the American colonies. So by the time Liverpool uh, kind of gained some traction in this industry around 1730, it's relatively late in terms of the kind of importation of slaves uh, to, the, um, to the colonies. But you know, occasionally, they would, uh, they would uh, um, disembark slaves there. And everywhere else. Right. So they went you know, to more than 60 different uh, places in the Americas, ultimately. Overwhelmingly British colonies, but in fact not always. Right. So among those other 50 would be Cuba and some Spanish and French colonies. Um, so they were doing you know, trade in an awful lot of places. Mostly the British colonies, mostly Jamaica and Barbados. Please. How many voyages? Yeah. So. Um, how many uh, voyages left Liverpool and uh, their first part of um, port of disembarkation was Jamaica? So this is, again, to give you a little bit of scale of the trade in Liverpool. What I'm showing you here are the number of voyages leaving from the three leading British slave trading ports, London in blue, Bristol in green, and Liverpool in red. Um, London initially leads this trade because there is uh, a company called the Royal Africa Company that has a monopoly. We've got a um, monopoly granted, which is strict until 1698. And then until 1712, other traders have to pay them a commission. After 1712, the industry really opens up. At that point, around 1712, 
Bristol becomes uh, an active rival of London. You know, and in, in certainly times in the around 1725, Bristol is the leading uh, slave trading uh, port in the, the UK. Relatively late, Liverpool emerges. Our data starts in 1730, so really kind of rather in the early stages of um, the trade um, from Liverpool. Uh, but you can see that it comes to dominate. Uh, it is not only among the British slave trading ports that Liverpool is dominant. These are the leading slave trading ports in the world, the kind of ports of origin of more voyages than anywhere else. Uh, and Liverpool is dominant between about the midpoint of the 18th century and 1807 when the trade is outlawed on British ships. Right? So uh, Liverpool has been called the slave trading capital of the world, the metropolis of slavery, um, you know, fitting super cats uh, given uh, the data. So uh, it's not just any port. It's not just any slave trading port. This is perhaps the kind of epicenter in Europe uh, for this trade. Uh, that, and we're studying you know, exactly who goes into the trade. Uh, why Liverpool um, is such an influential port here? Well, there you know, certainly could be some uh, explanations that come out of what we're going to show you in the analysis. Right? So I'm going to demonstrate that Liverpool um, actually takes a different response to the kind of cultural norms regarding uh, the slave trade in the UK. Right? So I think that could certainly, you know, is uh, a force here. Uh, but there are some arguments also that are uh, familiar to um, economic history. One is, and it's kind of a necessary uh, condition, uh, but Liverpool is quite early in terms of building docks. So they start to build docks right at the beginning of the 18th century. And they continue adding docks um, you know, for you know, centuries after that. Uh, but that's necessary to succeed in, um, you know, over the, uh, certainly over the century in uh, overseas trade. And they do that. They do that before some of their rivals. You know, London does it actually very late. Um, but they do it before Bristol and before Glasgow. Um, so they're early movers there. Now, by the way, um, as an explanation uh, for the rise of uh, Liverpool as a slave trading port, you know, there's something unsatisfying about the fact that they built docks because you know, it invites the question, why did they build docks? The explanation is that uh, the town council was captured you know, right around the beginning of the 18th century by tra trading interests. I'll show you a little bit of kind of data on that subsequently. Uh, but one historian calls it a commercial coup d'etat, uh, where overseas traders gain power in Liverpool. Kind of, then this is true relative to the other uh, uh, ports in uh, the UK. And they do what it takes in terms of investment, public investment, to make it a, a trading capital. Right, so first of all, the docks. There's a couple benefits of Liverpool's location. One, you can see, is proximity to the Isle of Man here. So the Isle of Man is a tax haven until 1762. Right, so to succeed in this trade, you need things to take to West Africa. Right? Now, Liverpool, subsequent, you know, later in the 18th century, some industries build up around Liverpool, and that's another advantage. But before that, voyages from Liverpool had very close access to the Isle of Man, where they could get, say, textiles that were brought by the Dutch you know, from, uh, from uh, India, for example. Right? So they had access to tradables um, in the Isle of Man. Uh, there's also an argument that Liverpool is advantaged based on its location, certainly relative to Bristol and London, um, because uh, Bristol and London, closer as they are uh, to um, uh, Europe, France in particular, uh, voyages from there were more exposed to privateers. Right? So during, um, during wars, which might be as many as half of the years in the uh, 18th century. You know, privateers are essentially licensed to take the ships of uh, other nations. Uh, and you know, they're a very big threat to overseas trade. 
And certainly, ships from London would have to pass through the English Channel, where they'd really be at the mercy of French privateers. Uh, the French could essentially cut off ships from Bristol here. Uh, Captains from other nations were loath to go to the Irish Sea. They viewed the Irish Sea as a very difficult place to navigate. And voyages from Liverpool would sail uh, above Ireland and farther away from, uh, from Europe. So they had this advantage of avoiding privateers. Um, one other aspect of the location is, again, it's related to the fact that you need something to trade. Uh, but in the 18th century, Manchester and Lancashire, which is this kind of surrounding region, uh, become leading industrial centers. Right, so Lancashire in terms of textiles and Manchester in terms of all kinds of industry, uh, you know, they much more f than say Bristol, uh, which really lags on this. Um, in Liverpool you have access to um, manufactured goods that you can use in this trade. And not only the fact that they're manufactured nearby, but Liverpool is actually connected by canals and some railways and so on. So really, there's this kind of regional system that uh, allows uh, both goods to go for trade overseas and allow, gives you ways to process the goods that you, uh, you bring back from the Americas. All right, so that's location. Now, a third aspect here is managerial acumen. Right, and there's a couple of manifestations of this. Um, I told you that Liverpool traders uh, were um, m uh, more likely to conduct trade in this kind of more complex way, uh, where as opposed to uh, loading slaves from a fort, they would be transacting directly with a lot of different merchants in Africa, traders in Africa. Right, so that's number one. That depended. The explanation for why they could do that was that they had better human capital. Uh, they had some effective business practices. Uh, so one actually that uh, my co-author and I have done a study on is that you know, if you think about the fact that these are kind of very early um, ventures in overseas trade, you know, the agency problem looms large. You know, the captains, you know, how do you make sure that the captain effectively protects the asset and represents the interest of the, um, of the owners? One way to do that is um, to give the captain an ownership stake. And in Liverpool, they w did that before, and they were more likely to do that than um, either London or Bristol. Right? So Brian and I have a study of the incidence of um, captain ownership and its e efficacy. Uh, and we identify, you know, one in this literature on governance, you know, identification is a big issue. And we take advantage of the length of these voyages and the fact that wars sometimes break out while the ship is at sea to identify the fact that, um, that uh, voyages where the captain has an ownership stake actually perform better than others. And uh, I don't at this point know why Liverpool uh, led the other ports in uh, using this managerial technique. Uh, that's perhaps a subsequent study, but you know, clearly they did. Um, couple other elements of their practice, perhaps an interesting one for economic sociologists, is that they really conducted what you'd have to call clientelized exchange with uh, traders in Africa. Right. So in a place like Calabar, you know, where you're dealing with you know, a dozen um, African chieftains who are essentially the suppliers of the slaves. Uh, the, one of the heads of the clans in uh, Old Calabar lived in a house called Liverpool Hall. Liverpool Hall was a house built in Liverpool, disassembled, taken to the west coast of Africa, and given to this chief as a gift. Right? But certainly an indication of the relationship between them. Um, there's, they conducted trade in a way that indicates um, uh, trust. You know, they had certainly ways of providing credit for each other, to each other even sometimes over years. Uh, one of the aspects of this clientelization is uh, it, late in the 18th century, it was uh, common for the sons of African traders to do what one of my uh, uh, historian uh, friends calls the equivalent of a junior year abroad in Liverpool. But they would go to Liverpool for a year of education, make connections in the industry, learn more about the language and the way that their tr English trading, par trading partners thought. And then, of course, they would return to the west coast of Africa and conduct uh, the trade from that point. Right? So uh, at some point, perhaps, is in a, 
the late 18th century, you might find as many as 50 a young African traders a year in Liverpool, essentially going through that process. Right? So, um, some advantages about the location, this early investment, uh, and the fact that they, in some ways, did the um, practice better. Um, uh, are the kind of the familiar explanations for uh, Liverpool's efficacy here. And by the way, let me invite you um, to ask. i will be happy if you ask questions as they occur to you. I, I don't mean to. Um, I don't mean to talk. You know, for for our whole time. So, uh, please just let me know. All right. So I'll say a little bit now. Um, I am going to kind of try and present in a way which kind of mirrors the way we wrote the paper, which is um, uh, the paper presents an analytic narrative. Right? So the idea of an analytic narrative is to take some of uh, kind of analytic tools from economics and other uh, fields and take advantage of the kind of uh, uh, historical uh, method of, of uh, producing a narrative and combine the two. Um, and what it means effectively is I'm not going to go through hypotheses, the context, and um, and then give you, give you a set of uh, analyses separate from that. We have all of those pieces, but they're kind of mixed in uh, to, to uh, the narrative. And one of the advantages that this gives, I think it, you know, in a circumstance like this, to me it kind of has the potential to produce something which um, will read better to people who are perhaps not uh, immersed in the theory uh, that, that we're working in. Uh, but it also forces you to kind of confront some of the kind of interactions between the forces that may be at work. I think that's actually uh, one, of the, um, you know, one of the benefits of the historical method. And it turns out actually to be quite significant in what we're going to learn uh, here in Liverpool. So this is the type of source of uh, our data. Uh, one of the kind of core sources is what's called the plantation register. So this is where ships leaving Liverpool uh, for the Americas, either direct or in the triangle trade, they would have to register. Uh, so this was done for taxes and other reasons. You know, the British were actually very good record keepers. Uh, so it's one of the advantages for you know, doing uh, this kind of research. Um, and you can see here that uh, these registers will give you information on the nature of the ship, and in particular for us, who owns it. Some of our other research, not this paper, relies on who the captain was. But, but that's, um, this is essentially how we're going to be identifying the owners, uh, the investors of, uh, of the kind of full set of voyages here. Uh, by the way, the um, Liverpool is unique between London and Bristol in that how much of this data has survived. Uh, everything was copied. There was copies kept in the port and copies kept in London. Um, but for both Bristol and uh, London, and both copies have burned over the centuries, but in Liverpool, uh, we still have enough uh, data left to identify the voyages from 1730 uh, to uh, the beginning of the 19th century. Um, I'm going to rely also on uh, s various sources, mainly city directories. Uh, we're going to look at the status of these investors uh, and the way we're identifying status is how they are described uh, in terms of their occupations. Merchants, gentlemen, captains, linen drapers, and so on. Right? So that's coming from various sources. That appears in the plantation register sometimes as well, but we're relying on city directories here too. Please. What was the difference between masters and owners? Yeah, so a master is the captain. Oh. Yeah, a master is the captain of the ship. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is just, uh, again, to show you that um, we're not just looking at the slave voyages. We're comparing them to the direct voyages. Uh, so you could be an investor in Liverpool overseas shipping without getting into the slave trade. In fact, most of the voyages were direct voyages. I think we have, you know, is it? Around 17% maybe are slave voyages, but there's lots of direct voyages. Right? So it's um, not at all the case that um, you have to be involved in the slave trade. In fact, overall, only 30% only of the investors engage in slave voyages. Okay? So there's a choice here uh, that, uh, that's being made here. It's not the case that everyone is one way or the other. 
Um, yeah, of course. Yeah, our data sources just peter out. They continue, actually. And in fact, um, uh, Liverpool thrives as a shipping center even after the slave voyage is, out, is outlawed. Right? So this is just from our data. Um, but at you, after 1807, you know, this actually continues to grow. Yeah. Other, other questions? OK, so as I said, I'll. Um, Abstract. I'm happy to kind of share the paper. Perhaps you've already seen it. But uh, we do an analysis of um, what essentially you could think about as the transition to the slave trade. Right? So uh, we analyze each voyage, the risk set that, and what I'm showing you uh, in this um, talk is the set of investors who have not yet invested in a slave voyage. Right? So, um, we're looking at the likelihood of someone who's not yet a slaver becoming a slaver. Right? You could certainly analyze the likelihood of continuing in the trade. We've done that as well. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Uh, we, this is, these are kind of logit models. These are logit models that I'm reporting to you, of course. You can analyze this as an event history, in which case you would get, you would be looking at kind of the time uh, for the transition of slavery as opposed to kind of the opportunity presented with each investment. Um, and it, we get kind of comparable results both ways. OK, so now I want to turn to the cultural status of the slave trade. Uh, and um, I'm going to make an argument which is perhaps a little bit subtle. But the key to it is I would like to convince you that it was not nor, it was not culturally approved. It was not normatively sanctioned to engage in the slave trade, even in 1730. Right, so my argument is that the slave trade was counter to some significant values that were part of the uh, British culture. Um, now, I want to be very clear. I'll try and say it again. Um, Part of making that argument, I'll present you a little bit of evidence on what other people said about the slave traders and their kind of response to slave traders. But to be absolutely honest, you know, I have to emphasize that before 1787, when the abolition movement begins, it was not the case that slave traders could expect, would expect to be visited by scorn when they walked down the street. Right? Certainly not in Liverpool, but. To be honest, not likely anywhere else. Mostly, the rest of British society did not talk about the slave trade or the people who participated in it. Occasionally, they would. And when they did, universally, they said, this is a nasty business, you know, yuck. But it didn't go farther than that. Right? So it's not the case in 1750 that you would expect to kind of have to run a gauntlet of uh, stigma to participate in this trade. That is true perhaps later, not in 1750. But nevertheless, the norms were there. Uh, the cultural values were there. Uh, occasionally, they would manifest themselves in what somebody would write or say uh, about a participant in the slave trade. Right? So you could think about, you know, I think about this as kind of you know, two solitudes. So you've got the cultural values and you've got the economic activity. and um, they're just kind of going on without confronting each other, even though that there's a tension between them. In the paper, I, re I suggest that to me it seems a little bit about like what some, some things that David wrote about the kind of cultural status of colonialism uh, in uh, Britain at a, you know, more or less the same time. Right? So let me tell you a little bit about you know, the, what's behind this conclusion that the cultural values were against the slave trade. Um, So it was never the case that boatloads of slaves landed in Britain. Never. Uh, occasionally, a plantation owner would bring back a slave from the Americas to, um, to Britain. When they brought those slaves back, they called them servants. They didn't call them slaves in the UK. And relatively early in the span of what we're analyzing here, certainly you know before um, Liverpool rides to its, rises to its complete level of um, dominance in 1772. Uh, 
it is the law, which had been a little bit gray, is clarified such that um, owning slaves in Britain is illegal. So slaves are pronounced free if they ever reach the, the shores of Britain. And so that's a Granville Sharp case. Happens a that's England. Happens a couple years later in, uh, in Scotland. Um, You'll get occasionally, and again, I want to emphasize this is occasional, but in kind of the rhetoric and the writings of that time, uh, you'll come across some attacks on the slave trade. Um, Gentleman's Magazine, the first publication to ever use the title magazine, 1740, um, there's a letter criticizing um, the, uh, uh, criticizing the trade. Uh, Chris Brown was a historian at uh, Columbia. And uh, I think kind of, you know, to me seems like the, the kind of leading light in terms of the um, intellectual history of the uh, abolition movement and the um, status of slavery in this time. Uh, he emphasizes, talking about these kind of occasional bubbling up of discussion of the slave trade, that first of all, they were always negative. There was never any positive accounts of what the slave trade did. Uh, and he also notes that the attacks were completely presented as if there was no controversy at all. Right? So it's not some kind of agitated defense of the argument against the slave trade. The presentation was, well, of course. You know, this is apprehensible. And, and essentially, you, know, you don't have to say much more than that. You'll get some. Um, some entry of uh, sentiments against this trade in children's literature in the first half of the 18th century, after 1787 all the time. But now I'm talking about kind of the long-standing status. Uh, let me read to you at least from one, um, one influential historian, Seymour Drescher, who I think would kind of was the uh, last generation's uh, leader in the examination of the kind of intellectual history around the slave trade. Uh, this is what he says about the kind of 18th century status of the trade in Britain. The language of anti-slavery ran through their, the British, rhetoric, their rituals, and their riots through the 18th century. A libertarian heritage, so now we're tapping into the bigger cultural values, was the dominant political ideology in the 18th century to which all groups subscribed. The world was made safe for Northwest European colonial slavery by the tyranny of distance rather than by universal principles. Right? So what he's saying there is that in terms of the, kind of the principles that were at the heart of the British culture, the slave trade was against them. Um, when people consider the question, there was no controversy over that. You know, they, they said, yes, this is apprehensible. It's against our values. They didn't consider it much. You know, it was a separate activity. If you're living in the metropolis, you would not confront this. You know, you would, uh, it's really happening um, an awful long way away in terms of uh, 18th, century, um, 18th century distance. But the interesting thing, you know, if you've got this kind of culture uh, and you've got this kind of buffering of this activity which is obnoxious to the culture, although profitable by distance, is that the slave traders were the bridge. They were the only bridge between the culture resident in Britain and the actual trade. Even the plantation owners in the Americas, well, they were located in the Americas. Right? And the, the kind of connecting point between the metropolis and the slave trade were these slave traders. Right? So they're actually you know, at the point where you would think this tension would come together. Um, after I've gone to these great lengths to kind of talk about the culture, but say, you know, I'm not arguing that you're, you're getting this constant um, stigmatizing of participants in, the, participants in the trade, I'll show you an instance of stigma on participants of the trade. Um, a famous stage actor. Uh, performing in Liverpool, drunk on stage, playing uh, Richard III, uh, stumbles. He's hissed by the audience. Uh, and his response is, what? You hiss me, George Frederick Cook. You contemptible money getters, I banish you. There is not a brick in your damn town but was being cemented by the blood of a Negro. Right, so this is very normative language. Right, so he's, uh, you know, he's banishing 
uh, the participants uh, in this trade, at least in the sense of participant participation in the accepted culture. And so that's a, so we're, this is all to say that we're looking at an activity which is um, uh, you know not not culturally supported. You know, there's no active uh, aggression against it until 1787, uh, but you know, it's not that its st moral status is uncertain. It is against the accepted culture. And I think one of the interesting things here is that you know, we know quite a lot about diffusion, uh, and even the diffusion of things which kind of start out with uncertainty, whether it's with regard to their technical efficacy or their moral standing. My understanding here is that as we're looking at the early stages of the trade in Liverpool, it's not the beginning of the trade in the UK, but in Liverpool, is that its moral standing was not uncertain. It was uncontroversial that its moral standing, standing was bad. But nevertheless, we're seeing the diffusion of this kind of deviant activity here. So you can think about this as the diffusion of deviance as well. David. Have you used the term slave trade? Yeah. Yeah. Not quite the same one could attack the slave trade as a dirty business yeah. and say, you know, whether slavery is good for the British colonies, but yeah. we could reform the slave trade, one could say, you know, so yeah. I wonder if any of these distinctions are actually. Uh, well, they, um, yeah, that's a fascinating question. Um, they do reform the slave trade. Right. That's one of the things that happens even a little bit before the abolition movement. So there's regulations about how many slaves and the size of the ship and the doctors and things like that. In fact, um, uh, by the end of the 18th century, the European sailors were not, are not my point is not that they uh, suffered more mortality as a function of the institution, but on the voyage from Africa to um, the Americas, more European so, uh, sailors died than the slaves themselves, because there had been a number of regulations that, and there's also been some kind of technical problems to the cause of mortality. So there was a tension to kind of reform in the industry. Um, the you know there's this, there's a separation between an abolition movement and an emancipation movement. So it, there's abolition in 1807. Emancipation comes some 20 years later. Is it? 18, early 1830s or late 1820s. Uh, so those were treated as separate questions. Um, and uh, uh, it's not an informed answer, but my speculation is, again, we're going back to these were, you know, these were the British engaging in this. You know, these weren't co colonists. Um, uh, so and, you know, even the pl uh, plantation owners would you know, be engaging in the activity somewhere you know, kind of long away. So uh, I guess I, in terms of you know why they might be felt, uh, perceived as different, the fact that um, that you you know actually have uh, uh, the you know Englishmen uh, conducting this trade. It was easier to stop the slave trade than to stop slavery. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes, and it's true. I, you know, again and. And the emancipation movement follows on, you know, pretty quickly, um, and it takes, you know, another short generation for it to happen. One of the interesting things I don't say anything about emancipation in this study, um, but one of the interesting things that I may not have a chance to mention later is I'm going to go on and tell you about how Liverpool fights the abolition movement. It kind of stands out uniquely. Um, once the abolition movement takes. Liverpool joins with some enthusiasm into the emancipation movement. Right? And in fact, there's um, uh, the uh, father of Gladstone, the, the, pri the prime minister, uh, was he was a, a plantation owner and a slave owner um, engaged in one slave voyage. But he's in our data as a slave trader. Uh, he is one, and he's one of uh, the type of uh, Liverpool residents who were protesting the abolition movement. But almost you know, right away, after the trade is abolished and they're no longer slavers, uh, they support the emancipation movement. It's really you know, quite a shocking transition. OK. Um, so uh, I had mentioned a little bit. So now I want to talk a little bit about 
you know, the question is who starts, um, you know, who engages in this trade, uh, and we're going to arrive at the fact that there is um, contagion. You know, from certain participants to others. There are some participants who are more likely to enter uh, first. And in both those processes, status matters. All right, so I'm going to show you evidence that high status <sighs> residents of Liverpool were more likely to enter the slave trade. And they're actually much more influential on whether their network contacts would enter the slave trade. Just a little bit. This is actually not really related to the data I'm going to um, uh, point to, but uh, this is the uh, town council in 1752. These are the participants in overseas trade. Okay, so it was you know it's never the case. You know by by say 1800 it's a lot uh, later than this, but you know the in 1800 there may be about 180th of residents in Liverpool who are actually investors in overseas trade. Um, the percentage would could possibly be it's conceivable it could be smaller in 1752 it might be the same uh, but you can see here that the the leaders of the city were just dominated by uh, investors in overseas trade now were they slavers overwhelmingly yes right so even among the investors in even among uh, all investors you know about 30 percent engaged in the slave trade. But you can see here that, what is it, 85% of the many overseas investors on the town council were also engaged in the slave trade. Right? So town council is not my indicator of status. But you know, it's clear here that people at the top of, in this case, the political status were engaged in slavery. There's a couple others here, uh, including the mayor, who were related to slavers. Okay? So in terms of the kind of power system here, um, slavers are, you know, dominant. I think you'd have to say. Well, what am I going to use in terms of status? Well, um, you know, if you have any interest in the kind of literature on status and economic behavior, uh, you'll know that um, there's a lot of attention paid to uh, a distinction. You know, it's conceivable not to even care that much about, but it's at least interesting to distinguish between the effects of status and other indicators of quality. Okay, so you could have status uh, in terms of honor, um, deference, or you could have status as a function of your capability or your resources. Right? And you might be interested in the effects of both those things, but you, know, you certainly could argue that they're different. Right? So in the literature on the effect of status and anti-normative, uh, counter-normative behavior, there's quite a lot of attention to try and differentiate quality from status. What we're going to look at in terms of one, we've got lots of options, but a very interesting indicator of status is what's called legal status. Right? So actually, in England at this time, you have a legal rank. Right? You're a gentleman, you're a yeoman, you're a free man. You might have higher status than that. You might be some member of the nobility. And actually, you have to report that rank on legal documents and voting registers and things like that because it has implications for how you are treated by the law. Right? So for example, who could sit on a jury for you and so on. Right? So we're going to look at particularly the definition of gentleman. Now, so this is where the title comes from. This is why this paper is The Gentleman Slavers, because we're interested in gentlemen who are engaged in the slave trade. So this is what a gentleman is. This is from a con contemporaneous legal account. Um, whosoever studieth the laws of the realm, who studieth in the universities, who professeth liberal sciences, and to be short, who can live idly and without manual labor, he will bear the port charge and countenance of a gentleman. He shall be called master and shall be taken for a gentleman. Um, so we are going to distinguish gentlemen from uh, merchants and everybody else. And the reason we're breaking merchants and everybody else are not different in terms of legal status. But merchants are essentially living by trade. Um, and it's a little bit closer to being idle. Right? At least it seems that way a little bit to us. It's an empirical question. And we're going to see, in fact, that there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, gentlemen are not the highest status in 
uh, England, right? So above the, this, there's knights and baronets and members of the nobility. Basically, none of them are in our data. Um, there is the odd baronet who was engaged in overseas trade and, slave, and the slave trade. As far as I can see, they gained those titles after um, they made their wealth. Right? So I don't see any evidence of, kind of baronets entering the trade. Of course, there's not that many of them. Right? So I, I'm not even going to get into the issue about why didn't the nobility engage in the slave trade. Um, uh, there's just you know there, there's that's you know if you look at say the, some of the voting registers here as as we do and I'll show you a little bit of analysis, um, you know you might get thousands of names and you know, one or two baronets they're they're very rare of course. This is the breakdown of 7,500 traders in our data of these categories of gentlemen, merchants, and others. Gentlemen of course are rare; they're less than two percent of our data. Um, you can see that just, uh, just this rough breakdown, forget um, the multivariate analysis for, the, for now, but they're more likely to engage in the slave trade. They don't engage in more voyages. Right? So these merchants are the most active investors. Right? The gentlemen are not the most active investors. So how about simply the effect of this status and the likelihood of entering the trade? Well, it is true that the highest status, um, uh, the highest status uh, investors, the gentlemen, are 65% more likely than the others to enter the slave trade. Ceteris paribus, you know, c controlling for everything that was in that uh, logit regression that I went by in six seconds. Right? But ceteris paribus, controlling for your network, your experience, and uh, a number of other things, people with higher status are more likely to enter. Right? So this makes us, this is actually kind of highlighted in the current version of the paper if you read it. I think it'll be kind of discounted in subsequent. Um, uh, versions, because there's a lot that we could say here, and I don't think the basic effect of status is for us the most interesting. But you could interpret this as evidence of status giving you the autonomy to violate norms. Um, the literature on middle status conformity is consistent with this. It suggests that you know people at the top of the status hierarchy have the autonomy to flout the norms because their position is quite sticky. Um, People in the middle are most likely to observe the, observe the norm. In this case, the norm was to forego the slave trade. And you might say, well, what? Is this middle status conformity? Because we stop here. You know, it looks just like you know, status. You, it looks like um, a negative effect of status on conformity, uh, not a uh, non-monotonic one. Remember, I don't, have the full, um, I don't have the full distribution of status here. Right? So low status in our society uh, are actually quite likely to participate in the slave trade. They don't participate as investors. It's impossible for them. They just don't have the capital to do them. But the crew on the slave voyages, or as one 19th century account called them, the dregs of the society. Right? So these are people on the run from the law, uh, people you know, in bankruptcy and shame and so on. You know, you're 20 per the, crew, the mortality rate of the crew is 20%. Um, it's you know it's not uh, it's not uh, kind of an appealing career choice to engage in these voyages. They're people of very low status that engage in crew. Right? So so to me that we see middle status conformity, high status engages investors, the very low status engages crew. Please. So the, uh, the low status uh, crew is more likely low status for slave trade than, than for slave trade. Um, I don't have any evidence of that. That certainly is kind of the, uh, the if, what you take from the history. Um, you know, the account that I just gave you that called them the dregs of society was talking particularly about the crew of the slave, the slave trade. Yeah. Please. Uh, to what extent are people that are gentlemen who are investing in the slave trade are aware that they're investing in, in slave trade? Or do they continue to use some of the best opportunities? Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, you couldn't miss the fact because the investment groups are on average three or four people. Right. So you couldn't miss the fact that what the voyage was doing. There's a lot of risk involved, right? Actually, you know, the slave trade has greater return but greater risk. Um, so uh, there, I think there'd be no chance that you wouldn't understand what the ship is doing. And the others who so others. Majority. 
Yeah, right. So others uh, appear in the data as people who are neither merchants nor gentlemen. Uh, and who are they? They're tavern or owner, draper, um, you know, br uh, bricklay. Brick they might be called a mason, but they wouldn't, you know, be a bricklayer. They'd be kind of a, a small business person doing doing that. Um, so they are actually doing things, um, and they would not be. They they would be uh, small business people. Otherwise, they wouldn't have the chance to for cap to invest. Um, they would, our understanding is that they would all be freemen, which means they'd have a certain amount of property and they'd be capable, allowed to vote and things like that. So actually, our others you know, would be towards the top of the overall status hierarchy. But lower than merchants. But, but, but lower than merchants and gentlemen, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Given that your definition is gentlemen, uh, that they're educated uh, in the large and Leisure, yeah. Um, that would it be matter what percentage of their portfolio gets invested in slave trade? Because yeah. you could be a gentleman uh, investor and invest five percent, yeah, ten percent in slave right. trade, but yeah. you're not really associated with that yes. in terms of your wealth, your, your main wealth, maybe in land, right? Uh, farming, um, legitimate activity, yeah. but a little bit of it in the slave trade doesn't hurt your image. Um, yeah. Now, whether they could, you know, have more capital, and uh, I'll say a little bit about their wealth. Um, it certainly could be the case that it's only a small part of their portfolio. That could be the case. I don't know. Um, but you know, what if you're a little bit involved in the drug trade in contemporary, you know, United States? You know, is the fact that you've got a kind of legitimate Tavern? Do we say, oh, look, that's 90% you know, legitimate business, but 10% drug trade? Um, you know, you're kind of stained by the counter-normative behavior. But in the prohibition, um, Joseph Kennedy was heavily involved in illegal yeah. activity with drugs, and it didn't stop him from being yeah. appointed yeah. pastor. You know, that's that's a very rel you're, you're right. That's a very relevant question for us. And I thought it is the case, by the way. It's not it's not true of the gentleman, but of these merchants, what they're trying to do is raise themselves in the world. And certainly, I don't know about, I can't tell you about the odds, but a lot of their kids go to Oxford and Cambridge and become clergy. And you know, some of their kids become gentlemen. Uh, they often, you know, the most successful slave merchants, their kids marry well, and they kind of you know, ra rise in the world. Um, and I think that that's relevant for my, I think you're, you're you know, right that there's a tension in my argument there. Um, a lot changes uh, after 1807. You know, there's a lot of contention that kind of dissipates very quickly after 1807, which is kind of indicated by the switch um, of some slavery uh, activists to support emancipation. Um, but I, I see the tension. I, I, I agree that's an important point. Yeah. Was there ever a I uh, know, no, there wasn't. Um, there's a little bit, you know, before, well, you know, quite shortly I'll talk about what happens during the abolition movement, uh, but it's really from outside the industry, and it becomes the rest of the country against the, the slave trading industry. Um, there is, as I mentioned to David's question, there's some, you know, starting maybe in, there's a couple of kind of precipitous incidents, kind of just horrendous, you know, uh, events uh, that just kind of shock the conscience of the nation, which bring down regulations on the industry. There's no indication that those, those kind of self-regulation, those are, those are imposed from outside. Well, what I mean by the investment, I mean kind of the same way in that there was an investment movement for South Africa, or yeah. it feels today, where it was yeah. uh, like normal people calling on... Yeah. Well, you know, that's very akin... Um, that's not how the abolition movement is presented, but I'm going to show you what happens. I'm going to show you what the network does, and I'm going to show you what happens to it in the abolition movement. And, and that interpretation, I think, has some traction with what I'm going to show you. Um, you, you could, but I, much prefer, I prefer this gentleman as an indication of status, because I don't think there's anything about what makes you a gentleman that um, indicates that you're better at this overseas trade. You know, it would suggest probably they're going to be worse at it, if anything. 
Um, but I've got other measures of status. So this is status in the network. You know, this is eigenvector centrality. Here I've got the whole continuum, and you see this middle, what you would expect if it was middle status conformity. Um, interesting. So Victor asked a little bit about the wealth. I mean, you could. Uh, the slave trade is more expensive to get into. You don't have to have a lot of money to get into because the you could join a big partnership. But on average, a slave trade investment took more capital than a direct trade investment, and it was more risky. So you might wonder, do gentlemen enter because they have more capital? Um, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I can say something about the wealth at the time they died for the 200 leading slave traders. Right? So that's you know, a fraction of you know, the data. Um, but I've got wills for the 200 leading slave traders. And those who are gentlemen on their death leave less money than those who are merchants. Right, so the merchants actually, you know, uh, in that group, had more money. Right? So um, you know, it's not purely a measure of your income that qualifies you as gentlemen. There's, there's a number of other things. Um, you might be, you know, certainly it's relevant to what it means that gentlemen have more likely to enter the trade and more impact on others, which I'll show you in a moment, whether they were better at the trade or not. This is an al analysis of whether their voyages had more success. And the short answer is that there's no definitive evidence that they were better or even worse. Right? It seems mostly that there is um, no difference between them and others. A couple of things. Um, I'm differentiating here. I'm not going to get into this distinction. But there's a ship's husband who is kind of the leader of the investor group. And then there's other investors, or some of whom may be essentially passive. I'm differentiating between the ship's husband and, and the others. Um, if the other investors were gentlemen, the ships were more likely to um, take on less slaves than they, um, they, they planned on. Uh, and you also do get an effect that the voyages, if the, if the husband was a gentleman, are shorter. Now, if everything else were the same, it would be important to have a shorter voyage. That would be better performance. Uh, but we don't know that everything else is the same. Right? So one thing we don't know is what they sold the slaves for. You could get a shorter voyage by paying more to take on slaves quicker and taking less to sell the slaves quicker. That's one way, certainly, you could do it. Uh, if you control, if you control uh, for kind of fixed effects on the African port and the American ports that the uh, voyages visited, that effect goes away. Right? So what this is really saying is that the ships led by gentlemen were going to some different ports than, than some others. Right? Now, there could be a performance effect in there, but we can think about some other things that could cause that. Yeah? Do you have any information about the religion? I don't. No, I don't. Um, because yeah. it's a natural candidate. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Um, I have an inkling. Um, I have an inkling that you might be able to identify the Quakers. I've got a colleague at Columbia who did a lot of reason, he, who knows kind of the names and the locations of Quaker families. So I, I've kind of thought of tapping into that. Now, the Quakers lead the abolition movement, right? But you, know, so you may know that that does not necessarily lead to a prediction that they wouldn't have invested in the slave trade. In the US, you know, Quakers are very important in the emancipation movement but often are also slaveholders. Right? But I think that that's at least possible to get at, and I think it would be a, an important variable. And it might be related to the gentleness. It might indeed. It might indeed, yes. Um, now let me ask, do I go until 6? So I have 25 minutes, is that right? Well, we'd like to turn over the questions maybe 15 minutes. Oh, OK, all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to race. OK, I thought, I thought we were doing questions as we went along, so let me race ahead. You have been doing yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, I've got kind of the, what I'm most interested in. So, so let me kind of show it to you and leave you some time to questions. Um, there's a network here. Right? And I'll simply say that we, have, we connect the investors to each other by co-investment groups. Right? You and, you know, if I invest with Todd. That's a network connection. They're tied in our data. Um, it is possible 
to be connected to a slaver without engaging in a slave voyage. Because if Todd has engaged in a slave voyage and engages with me in a direct voyage, I'm now connected to somebody who's a slaver. Okay, so we're going to look at the effects of the network. And we are going to look at, um, uh, in particular, you know, the difference between slavers and non-slavers in that network. Um, I'll just go over that. So in this analysis, I'm making an assumption. I'm going to relax it. It's not a very good assumption. It just simplifies the presentation. I'll relax it later. I'm assuming that the effect of my connection to a slaver to pull me into the industry is of equal magnitude to the effect of a non-slaver to pull me out. So what I'm estimating here, my variables, is I've counted the number of slavers of different status that I'm attached to. And I've, say, the gentleman slavers. And I've subtracted the gentleman non-slavers that I'm attached. So it's a net exposure to gentleman slavers, merchant slavers, or other slavers. Okay. Of course, it could be the case that non-slavers and slavers have different magnitudes of influence. I'm going to show you a model that, that relaxes my assumption later. Um, the bottom line here, though, is you can see that the gentlemen are much more contagious. If you're connected in your network to a gentleman slaver, 75% more likely to enter the industry. It's also true that if you were connected to gentlemen non-slavers, they're very influential to keep you out of the industry. Victor. The question is, is the gentleman slaver you can invest in something but not identify with that investment. But you can also invest in something and identify with it. And, yeah. and, 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 and uh, is, so like yes. getting oh, that's a, a sense of yes. what's the intensity involved? Yeah, it's a, that's very useful for me. And I'm, uh, I'd never thought about it that way. But I am going to argue that it is an identity. And I've got some consistent evidence with that. Because these effects get bigger during the abolition movement. So when we start attacking the slave trade, gentlemen slavers become more influential to pull their contacts into the. So it doesn't wash off them. You know, they, they behave differently when essentially we, the rhetoric heats up around abolition. So it's a network of people who look at each other and say, we're involved in the same business. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's right. That's how I see it. Um, OK, so there's that effect. Now, you know, I wish I had half an hour to talk about this, because it's going to be important in where the paper goes forward. But um, I've talked about kind of British culture, and the slave trade is kind of counter to British culture. But you could also argue about the, you could suggest that Liverpool just had a counter culture. Right? Um, and that there were different norms active in Liverpool. I think that would feel true to me as well. Um, this is kind of getting at the diffuse influence of Liverpool. I think this is a network effect too, but it's not your partners. It's who you meet on the street or in the club and so on. And we're collecting data on club memberships. But anyway, if you live in Liverpool, our investors could live at anywhere, but they could be outside Liverpool or in. But if you live in Liverpool, Ceteris Paribus, you're 86 more likely to percent more likely to enter the slave trade. Right. So this means you're kind of exposed to the. Um, to the different values or the different rhetoric in Liverpool. Um, all right, now so let's get, let me get to the abolition movement, um, and I want to cut the, ch the chase here because um, I've got an effect which you know I'm excited about and I want to show you. Um, the abolition movement takes off incredibly quickly, and one of the arguments about why that happens in 1787 is that the values were there. Right? So this is what people like Seymour Drescher and Chris, Bra Chris Brown say. They say, yes, it takes off so quickly because the values were there. It was just like lighting you know, dry brush. Um, uh, in 1787, 1788, essentially you have petitions coming from everywhere, every city, against the slave trade. 10,000 people sign a petition against the slave trade in Manchester, which is part of the kind of economic gravity of Liverpool. That's where they make the things that go into the, the slave trade from Liverpool. But 10,000 people sign a petition against. It's a huge proportion, probably just about all the free men, um, except Liverpool. In Liverpool, until the end, they are petitioning for the slave trade. Uh, the town fathers organize pamphlets and invest, you know, essentially they give grants to researchers to support the, 
uh, slave trade. Uh, one of the interesting things here is it is before 1787, there are no arguments in favor of the slave trade. You didn't have to make them because nobody was attacking it. But in 1787, they start investing in those arguments. Um, so you get lots of pamphlets taking off. You get really Liverpool defending itself and put on the defensive. So you can see town guides, which in the 1770s just describe the slave trade in terms of its numbers. In this early part of the abolition movement, they start defending the trade. At the end, they start breaking up the participants from the trade away from everybody else. In fact, there's 18, beginning of the 19th century, there's a town guide of Liverpool, which actually very critical of the uh, participants in the slave trade, recognizes the money they give to the welfare institutions and so on, but calls them devils. Right? So you get this real rhetoric activity. Um, now, what's, what could be the effect of this? You know, this is the effect of the social movement. It's, push, it's making essentially the culture that was passive before more active. You might expect a mean shift. Right? So you might just expect an abolition dummy variable, which makes it less likely to go into the slave trade after the abolition movement takes off. But what happens instead is there's polarization. Right? The forces for the slave trade become more active. I'm going to show you the evidence in just a moment. And at least one of the ways that this uh, social movement is working is at a dyadic level. It's working through the network. And what I see this is essentially shifting the conversation, or in fact, ramping it up, enlivening it by making the slave trade salient and by providing the rhetoric for the people who want to argue for it and against it. So let's go back to our network. Um, this is, I showed you the network effect that had the you know, gentlemen were much more influential than others. Now I'm breaking out the influence of the network during the abolition movement in red and before the abolition movement in blue. You can see, of course, it just jumps out that the network matters, this kind of social influence, much more during the abolition movement. Now, you know, these investors were not participants in that abolition movement. Right? So we're talking about their conversations as they are affected by what's happening around them in the culture. Uh, and here, this is the model where I relax that assumption that both um, slavers and non-slavers have the same network influence on their partners or the same magnitude. Um, so let me just show you this. So here, you know, we've got in this model 12 different network effects. Right? And I'm breaking up um, for every rank, every level of status, I'm breaking up the effect of Slavers from non-slavers during the abolition years and non-abolition years. All right, so we've got slavers, non-slavers, abolition, non-abolition for both others, merchants, and gentlemen. Now there's three consistencies here that um, you know, to me are um, they're quite provocative. One is it is always the case that gentlemen have more social influence than merchants have more influence than others. It is always the case that your contacts who are slavers pull you into the industry. Your contacts who are uh, non-slavers increase the likelihood that you'll stay out of the industry. And it is always the case that those effects are bigger during the abol abolition years as opposed to the non-abolition years. Those three consistencies happen across you know, these 12 regressions. Now, one thing which is hard to eyeball from this regression is you, know, you can see this big effect of your gentleman slaver contacts during the abolition movement. And you can see this effect um, uh, of the non-slaver gentleman contacts you have during abolition to keep you out of the slave trade. Because this is a multiplier of the rate, it's hard to actually understand which has more magnitude. It's not simply how big it appears on the graph. What you actually want to do is multiply this discount factor by the, um, the positive effect of the slavers. So in the next analysis, I'm just going to show you who's more important, the slavers or the non-slavers. And you can see here, for the others and the merchants, it doesn't make much difference. Right? It, what my old assumption that they had equal effect is about true. For the gentlemen, 
it is the case that during the non-abolition years, the gentlemen slavers in your network are much more influential on you, much more. During the abolition years, it switches, and the gentlemen non-slavers in your network are much more influential on you. Please. I'm just wondering how mixed the networks are. Merchants tend to be connected primarily to other merchants, and nothing to other gentlemen. And also, yeah. if there's if if the effect of being Yes. Um, the answer to the first question is they're pretty mixed. There's some homophily, as you would expect, but there's so few gentlemen that they didn't just invest in cliques, right? So, and it's true of the merchants and the others. So there, there's some homophily, but they mix. Um, the answer to the second question is that if I don't get that effect. Um, and you know, we've got kind of, you know, in the the model that we're interpreting here, there's kind of 12 network effects and. We could make it 36 by you know, having different impact, but you know, essentially we're kind of testing the, the, you know, how much variance we have here. Um, OK, so you, you, can, you can actually take, you know, interpret my model to uh, look at the effect of ab There's other effects of abolition. It switches what it means to live in Liverpool. There is a main effect of abolition as well. Right? So I showed you the polarization, but it does have a kind of mean shift effect as well. Um, so you could interpret my set of variables to indicate the effect of abolition and the likelihood of entering the slave trade for different types of investors. If you're average, We've got these are this is the magnitude of the of Liverpool culture, of the movement and of the network. If you've got a lot of gentlemen in your um, network, it's the network effects which are really influential. Um, gentlemen slavers here, but they're increasing the likelihood that you enter. And uh, this is if you've got gentlemen non-slavers. So essentially, we can kind of decompose. Abolition has uh, three effects. It shifts the diffuse Liverpool effect. It has its own direct effect to kind of shift the like, you know, mean shift of the likelihood to enter. And it just switches the impact of the network. And it really depends on what kind of network you have, whether you're more or less likely to enter the trade after the abolition movement. You know, one of the interesting things is that um, Liverpool increases its dominance in the slave trade during the abolition movement. So it's not the case that they just kind of peter out. You got this effect that really says that mostly if you're outside the trade, you stay out during the abolition movement because we get kind of a shift of the social influence that favors the non-slavers. But the people who are in the trade double down. Right? And the, the trade itself expands because they persist. They don't, uh, they don't you know, decide to quit the industry during the ab abolition movements. Uh, I'll just show you one other thing, which is what I've maybe someone will have ideas about what I should do with this. Um, but one thing I've been looking at recently is the 1806 parliamentary election. So um, the British, uh, at this time, you would record who you voted for, you know, so we could make sure that you followed through on the deal we made to buy your vote. Uh, and uh, the, in Liverpool, there were three candidates for two slots. Roscoe was not just in terms of uh, candidates for parliament, but he was really the leading light of the abolition movement in Liverpool. He was not a shipping investor. He was kind of a dilettante. He was a, um, a historian of the Medici and things like that. Um, but uh, he, he was a poet, and he led the argument um, for the abolition movement. In 1806, he stood for parliament. Uh, the members of parliament in um, Liverpool had always opposed abolition, as you would predict up to that point. Now, the interpretation, contemporary interpretation, which is actually been picked up on some subsequent historians, is that 1806 election was not run on slavery. Roscoe wins one of the two slots, uh, but the explanation is he bought the election. There's nothing shameful about that at this time. You know, it's completely common, but he paid more to buy the election than the other two. Um, this says that there's at least something else going on. Right? So this is the likelihood of voting for Roscoe if you were a slaver. And you're 70% less likely to ro vote for Roscoe if you're a slaver. The slavers vote for Tarleton, who is the one of the three who doesn't get elected.
There's also a network effect that if you've got Roscoe voters in your network, you vote for Roscoe. Um, you might look at this, and the fact that there's a Roscoe network effect and, and not for the other two, and say, oh, you know, that's where the social influence works you know, for Roscoe, but no one is telling their friends to do these shameful things and vote for Tarleton. Um, I'm not ready to conclude that. I'm still kind of cleaning the data. And if I kind of estimate these models on subsets of the data that I have more confidence in, you'll certainly get a network effect for Gascon. You know, if I vote for Gascon and I'm friends with David, he's more likely to vote for him. So there's, it's not only Roscoe's uh, uh, voters uh, electing each other. But in any case, one interpretation of this election um, that it was uh, money and not, it's, it's not all money. You know, the, the slaving interest enters here. By the way, Roscoe votes for abolition, and he's mobbed when he returns to Liverpool. Um, he leaves the parliament, and he never, um, uh, he never engage, he engages a lot of civic activity, but he never stands for election again. Um, let me open up to questions, please. Uh, I'm using them. So I'm using them the same. I don't know who your friends are. I just know who you invest with. Yeah. So I may I may say friend, but what I mean is who you invest with. Do you have to know historically what the relationship there is? Business, Yeah. I, I don't know much about it. Um, they're small groups, um, so it's not like investing in a public company. Um, at the same time, I don't think that there's really a barrier to trust because uh, they are, the ship's husband is active in managing the voyage. He's not on the voyage, but they, he stipulates out the orders to the captain and so on. Uh, the others are quite likely to be passive, you know, so uh, I don't think it depends on like your teamwork and things like that. I don't think. You know, I would say, I'm not going to take your money because I don't trust you. I don't think that would really enter in once I get your money. Um, and I would have to know you because it's a group of three or four. It would be a different effect if it was friendship, then it's maybe normative, the network effect. Whereas if it's uh, not friendship, then it's more learning in terms of, oh, this is a great yeah. investment. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's good. Um, it could be some learning, right? But this is what I would I go back to. If it was all learning, I don't deny that some of it is learning about investment opportunities. I think you, know, you probably have to face up to that. But if it was all learning, gentlemen would not be so much more influential than anyone else. Right? Who are, what's the advantage of gentlemen over, say, the other who may be a tavern owner in terms of exposing you to investment? If it's just learning about gentlemen are not better investors, you know, you learn the, as a function of your position in the network. But to me, the fact that the status matters so significantly, um, I interpret as saying that there's something normative going on here as well. I, I can't deny that you're learning about opportunities through the network. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. I'm wondering, uh, in terms of, of the, the character of social influence besides learning, besides sort of having a full discussion, um, might this also be a sort of Devlin S uh, status Gentlemen are, are men of leisure, and so they're, they're, they have greater incentive to, to just accumulate for the sake of it rather than the merchants who maybe are, are uh, yeah. actually making a profit. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it sounds feasible in terms of you know, what I know. And again, it's, it's nothing like a census, but the gentlemen die with less money than the merchants among the slavers. Right. So um, the, you know, the people who made the fortunes in this industry, they were not gentlemen. They were merchants. Um, but why the gentlemen invest, you know, I think that they, they could have some other um, I ideas. Um, you know, you, I've seen nothing that would lead me to believe that you would engage in this as kind of recreational. Right? It was. Um, you know, I've talked about the normative status of the business. The people you have to engage with to launch one of these voyages, if you're like the managing partner, are disgusting to you. Um, you're, you know, there's all, we've talked about kind of at the very high level the British culture, but you're, 
you know, the kind of belief, the correct belief about what happens on these voyages. There's just complete disgusting things, and there's sexual deviance and things like that. So it's a way of kind of accumulating. Um, it's attaching you to, you know, some people who I think could really compromise your, your status. Yeah. So I, it would seem an unusual strategy to me. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering about the heck of your name, the gentleman. Yeah. Um, I mean, David mentioned religion as a possible uh, variable, but is, is gentleman is something, is something you abort with in status? Could you emerge and become a gentleman? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, Theoretically, yes. Uh, there's some there's some ways it can kind of descend as a function of you know the first son and so on of various ranks. So the answer is both. You know, so if a merchant sends his son to Oxford or the son becomes a, a parson, um, they they become a gentleman. Um, this is we we're initially very interested in looking at the dynamics, um, and it turns out we don't have so many gentlemen and we don't see so much change across time. There is a shift here, which we really go into in the paper um, quite a lot. There's another rank called Esquire. And um, it's actually, it's kind of you know, a notch above gentlemen. So Esquires actually have a higher rank than gentlemen. What happens is that Esquire proliferates in this time. And there's a lot of people who start out as merchants who become Esquires. Uh, there's a lot of people who list themselves in the directory as merchant esquire. No, one person lists themselves as gentleman merchant. It, that's very rare. Um, so what it seems like is that these aspirants claim the title of esquire. Um, uh, and you, know, you don't get that proliferation of gentlemen. There's one person in our data who has the right to call himself an esquire because he was mayor of Liverpool, but when he dies, lists himself as gentleman, right? which is kind of consistent with our idea that gentleman has ma maintained some kind of purity, but esquire has just become this, you know, it's, um, this, uh, this category that everyone who has some kind of claim, you know, the nouveau riche claim the title of esquire. Yeah. Owner captain uh, was the person that made the most profits uh, yeah. consistently. And were these the merchants, or are they just a separate category? Yeah, no, no. They, it, that's an important question for us. They were more likely to be the gentleman. Okay. So, yeah, and um, I'm still kind of zeroing in on that effect. Um, but uh, you know, what we're relying on is who was listed first in the ownership list. And other people have said that's essentially the master of the, I don't want to use the master because that means on board, but the husband, right? Um, so it's not only us who have kind of identified that ordering as be important. And the gentlemen are more likely to be high on that order. You're right about that. Well, I see we're running out of our, we've run out of our time. And I want to say this, that in this month is the last month that you can see uh, a wonderful exhibit down at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City on inventing abstract art. And Paul Ingram is the only sociologist in the world that has a huge display there in the Mu Museum of Modern Art which gives a network analysis of how abstract art was invented. It's a beautiful display uh, and certainly the centerpiece of a wonderful exhibit on the rise of abstract art uh, in U Paris, Europe, and New York City. And this is quite a first. I don't think any sociologist has put up in the Museum of Modern Art such a wonderful display of uh, sociological insight work together that linked people like Pablo Picasso with Max Weber, Alfred Stiglitz in, in New York City, and a whole array of the artists and intellectuals that created modern art as we know it. Uh, so go down, I really recommend this uh, exhibit. It's worth it to take a bus down just to see this exhibit, and it's going to be gone uh, shortly. Would there be a book from this? Uh, there is a book, museum? yeah, uh, there's a book, yeah. And yeah. we're going to use the, but you will see it on the new CSCS website, because Paul generously will allow us to use this as an example of a market institution
economic arrangement that produces abstract art linked together through, apps, uh, through networks. So thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. That was nice. Thanks, Victor. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.